Let's talk about standing waves. Standing waves. So if we were wiggling this wave on a string here, wiggling this wave on a string, and I just started to wiggle this thing, and it shows one wave. So, and eventually that wave's going to invert, right? But as long as I keep wiggling it, once that wave starts traveling down, I'm still wiggling, I create another wave. And so I'm all the time creating new waves that are traveling this way. In the meantime, there's more waves that are traveling back. And so at some point, I'm going to have a wave traveling this way and a wave traveling back that might overlap in some way, shape, or form. Well, in this case, how are those two waves going to overlap? Are they going to be additive or subtract from each other? They're going to be subtract. What do we call that? Based on the superposition principle, but it's what kind of interference might we ref destructive? What do we call it when they add to each other? Constructive. constructive. So in this case, they're out of phase. So this one's all positive, this one's all negative, and you add a positive and a negative, and they kind of cancel. And if they're exactly equal and absolute, they'd cancel perfectly right when they're passing. But once they've passed each other, you'd see the waves again. But just the moment where they cross perfectly, you probably see nothing as these are equal in amplitude and stuff like that. So, but as a result, as, as you're continually oscillating it, as you have more waves traveling forward and more waves traveling back, so you end up, if you oscillate it at just the right frequency, so this is where maybe I'm oscillating it up and down, and you might end up with a situation like this. So, and you find that the whole rope just is moving up and down, up and down. We call this a standing wave. A standing wave has what we call fixed nodes. What's a node? Where they're not waving. Yes, I like your answer. So it's where they're not waving, but we'd say that where there's no vertical displacement whatsoever. So a node technically is a, val you know, a value where some sort of wave type function goes to zero. Notice. If you look at a sine function, wherever the sine function crosses zero, that's called a node. Same thing here, both the wall here and this end here. So where I'm wiggling it, if provided I'm you know, just not wiggling it too difficult, but those would be called nodes. So, and you'd find these different sets, if you're oscillating at just the right frequency, you can create these. Now if you don't hit just the right frequency, you don't create these standing waves. So the next one you might create, would be this guy with the corresponding anti-wave from the reflection. And notice, and I, you can draw this either way, but whether the wave going forward or the reflecting wave coming back, this point right here doesn't move up or down. And not moving up or down, it's a node. And so as we start changing the frequency to higher and higher frequencies, we can start getting standing waves that have more and more nodes. But these only occur at set frequencies. So, and there is a big, ugly, long derivation to show how you calculate the wavelengths, frequencies of these lovely standing waves. I'm not going to drive it. I'm just going to give it to you. So it's on your handout. If you're looking for like wave on a string, so the wavelengths for these standing waves It's 2L over N here, where N can be any integer, starting at 1 and working your way up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so on and so forth. So, so N is the number of antinodes as well, for sure. So, but it starts at 1. Notice you can't have zero antinodes. So if you notice, this is the first. How many antinodes? Four. 1. And so n would equal 1, and you could calculate out your wavelength. But notice, you can kind of see, how much of a wavelength is this? It's half of a wavelength. And so in this case, the whole wavelength would have been twice as long, right? And so I can see that when I solve for the wavelength for this most fundamental situation, and plugging in n equals 1, what does that wavelength come out to? twice as long as the length of the rope. So it kind of makes sense. And you can work your way further and further and further. But end of the day, this is what you need to know. N can only take on integer values. 
So when you plug in n equals 1, we call that the first harmonic. When you plug in n equals 2, second harmonic. n equals 3, third harmonic, so on and so forth. Also, so n equals 1 is called the what again? Which harmonic is that? When it, first harmonic. When n equals 1, it also has a special name. We call it the fundamental uh, frequency, if we're talking about the frequency anyways. Cool. So I gave you the equation for wavelength. You also got to know the equation for frequency. But I didn't give you the equation for frequency because I didn't need to. Let's look back over here. Frequency of a wave times wavelength of a wave always equals the velocity of that wave. If you rearrange this, what's frequency equal to? Yeah, equals velocity over wavelength. And if we look here, to get the frequency then, I would take the velocity of the wave divided by the wavelength. And so you'll find out, if you take v and divide by this, you end up with nv over 2l as your frequencies. Cool. So you can find these different frequencies or wavelengths for the standing wave on a string. Cool. If they said find the first harmonic, you're supposed to know that, oh, that means plug in n equals 1. Whether they're asking for the fundamental frequency or the fundamental wavelength, you know, for that first harmonic, they're going to specify. But usually if it just says first harmonic, we're usually looking for frequencies. I gave you the simpler of the two equations, knowing that you could then just take velocity divided by that to get the frequency. So the fewer equations you have to memorize, the better off you are. Cool, quick question. With standing waves, so eventually you're going to see and treat these not with just a string on a, uh, a wave on a string that's fixed at one end, but you'll deal with pipes, like a flute. And those flutes can be open on one end or they can be open on both ends. Have you actually even treated those in class? I couldn't find any evidence of it in your notes. Sweet. They're on your handout and how those equations work, but I don't think you've got there yet. When you deal with sound very shortly, you'll probably see that as well. So, but it's another example of standing waves that you just haven't seen yet. Cool. Let's look at an example of a problem here. So, in finding the fundamental wavelength, and so in this case, Again, being fundamental, what's n? And so in this case, what's the length of the string? At 0.25 meters divided by 1. And lo and behold, what's your wavelength? Yeah. Twice as long as this string as we looked at earlier. Cool. Anybody play guitar? Not well. <laughs> Anybody play any stringed instrument of any sort? What do you play? Violin and, piano. Violin and piano. Sweet. We don't normally think of the piano for us that aren't musically talented as a stringed instrument, but it definitely is. <laughs> so if you look, one other thing, just want to plug in there. I don't have any real examples of calculations for it, but if you look at So if you look at the velocity of the wave on a string, so that velocity depends on the force applied to that string. What do we often call the force on a string? Tension on that string, let's say. So divided by mu here, where mu is called the linear mass density. It's not mass per volume, but mass per length of that string. And so notice, if you look at your guitar, the strings don't all look the same, right? Some of the strings are bigger, if you will, or fatter or greater diameter, and some are smaller, and they're going to have different values of mu. And having different values of mu, that's going to allow them to have different velocities of the wave they can carry. And we can tighten them, put more tension, or loosen them, put less tension, and that will change the velocity. By changing the velocity, what does that allow us to change? 
the frequency as well. And so that's why we use the different size strings to get different possible frequencies from the different strings and things of the sort. So, and then again, we can tighten or loosen the tension to just alter it to get it in pitch and things of this sort. So, but that's kind of the basis there. So just one little extra equation. It's plug and chug. How many variables are in this equation? Three. Three. So if I want you to solve for one, what do I got to give you? The other two. Technically, I could make it so that this equation had four variables. If instead of mu, I gave you m and l instead, the mass of the string and the length of the string. But oftentimes, we'll just tell you that the string, you know, weighs um, 100 grams per meter or, you know, something like that, and just give it to you right off the bat. You might have to convert it to SI units or something like that, but it may just be given directly as mu. Or it just maybe give you the mass of the whole string, the length of the whole string, and you've got to calculate it before you plug it in. But it's just plug and chuck.